Hi. We complete the story of David and Goliath today uh, with the final battle. And as we do, we might note that although this is a famous story of a battle, the battle only takes place in one or two verses, as we'll see here. The overwhelming majority of the chapter is talk, and talking about talk. So we'll have to at least consider why the writers spent so much time, 47 verses up till now, talking about fighting Goliath, and only a couple of verses actually showing the battle. As we do, we're going to find that the authors or editors or somebody, uh, based on uh, whether it's the function of the story having been composed over different times by different people and edited together at some later point, it's hard to say, but there are overlapping chiasms in this section that I want to draw attention to. So as you can see on the right side of the screen, we've been looking throughout the chapter at the shape of the entire chapter, which we reach the final part here, the battle and the aftermath in the valley, uh, having been paralleled at the beginning by the setup for the battle in the valley and the, the Hebrew word gai, only used in these two places in 1 Samuel, highlighting the shape of that. But we also looked last time uh, at the chiasm from verse 40 to 50 here that we looked at on um, the actual coming up to the battle uh, together and we saw the connection of that and then the internal chiasm within that so that the C part of the chiasm that goes 11 verses from 40 to 50 is itself its own little chiasm. Uh, and uh, so that overlaps the larger chapter chiasm as we can see here because here 40 verse 40 is in the C1 part and the uh, verses 42 to 47 are here and then 48 to 50 are here. So the chiasm from 40 to 50 covers several of the pieces here. To make that one step more complicated, there's also a little chiasm in our section here, plain to see, uh, and you can see it right on the screen there, and we'll go over it as we do, and that of course overlaps both of them. That starts in 48, so it overlaps the one from 40 to 50, and then as we saw in the whole chapter, uh, our section here starts at 48 and goes to 54, and this little chiasm only goes up to 52. So that perhaps is fitting with the fact that as we'll see, the verses seem to have a chronological problem here, and different scholars uh, have a different approaches to how to look at it. The main choices being different sources edited together or perhaps a flashback and a flash forward kind of element as we'll see. So uh, none of those is right or wrong. They are all trying to make sense of the text so let's try to do that ourselves together. So we start here in verse 48 when the Philistine drew nearer to meet David and as we've been seeing throughout in the key words in this section here uh, the question of drawing near and coming on as we see here and here uh, as part of the ongoing theme of them getting closer and closer. While I have this uh, chart up which we've been looking at throughout if you haven't been watching the other videos just to note the parts in bold here are the parts that are in the Hebrew the Masoretic text but not the Greek the Septuagint text. So the non-bolded parts here are all the Septuagint and the Hebrew, and the bold parts are the parts that are only in the Hebrew. And as we saw earlier, there's a big chunk here uh, that's only in the Hebrew, and so the Septuagint went from here to here. But now that we're in this chunk here, this is where we are right now, um, you see that the Hebrew has several verses or even part verses uh, put in the midst of it. And we're going to go right up to here. And so next time we'll look at the part that's only in the Hebrew that ends it here. So we have to be reading this both from the perspective of what it would sound like if we have the Hebrew parts, these parts here, and what it sounds like if we, if we don't. Because different readers over different times had different versions of this story. So as they grew nearer to meet, when the Philistine grew nearer to meet David, David um, ran, and this phrase right here is not in the Septuagint. That's the first part of it here, as we see. Uh, the running, though, uh, echoes his earlier running, and David runs four times in this chapter, and the running here is what is part of what makes the little chiasm. Uh, he runs at the beginning, and he runs again. And plainly, he doesn't need to be running here, um, because he's already dead, or if not quite dead, already dying. Um, but perhaps that's to make the chiasm, or perhaps it's to highlight that David is young and can run around. And when we look at the end at some artistic images from the Renaissance era we'll see David is always portrayed as quite the young man and at the in the postscript that we'll look at next video that's how Paul or Saul perceives him and it's repeated three times. So David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. Notice he's running to the battle line and not running to the Philistine but running to the battle line to meet the Philistine. 
Uh, presumably that is highlighting the part that we've been looking at from uh, Gladwell's perspective, that David had the advantage all along, that the traditional view of this is David is the underdog who can only beat the giant Goliath because Yahweh came to his help uh, miraculously, allowing the stone to hit the, the little bare spot on uh, Goliath's forehead, that in fact, as a slinger, he had the advantage over the cumbersome giant in his heavy armor. Uh, so we'll we'll see how that plays out right here. So David put his hand in his bag, which means he had to let go of the staff that he was holding the hand in as a decoy. So now all in one movement, uh, he puts a staff aside and does it, and it's in one sentence, and it's done. The whole verse here, as you can see, just in one sentence. This will be recalled later in chapter 25. Um, we'll look at it there. So he put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, uh, despite the fact that last time I showed a whole series of books uh, published recently called Five Smooth Stones on various topics of pastoral ministry and other things, there's only one stone involved. He took it, slung it, and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. It all happens just like that. But there are some questions here, just the same. So uh, the, the verb for slinging is only here in its recollection elsewhere uh, in 1 Samuel, but here it's recalling the place that we noted earlier uh, in Judges that slingers could hit a hair. Um, and then in Jeremiah, it's Yahweh the slinger who will uh, sling Israel away in that case. Struck the Philistine in the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead. So a couple of things here. Um, the word for sank here, to there, uh, no verb, no vowel to pronounce that out loud, but tuba in the form here and sank. Uh, it just as the Egypt's troops sank in the Exodus, so really the sense of sinking in water, not just the sense of hitting it, uh, but sinking and disappearing. And then under forehead, I want to note um, here a couple of scholars citing here Ariel Adim um, in the, te the article noted there for translating this word mitzvah as grieve, which is to say not his forehead, but the protective plate over his uh, calf, over his uh, lower leg, the place where the knee, um, below the knee where the armor has a space, and quote, renders his armor unserviceable, which leads him to fall forward. Being hit in the forehead would likely lead him to fall backward, i.e. not face down. And that's one of the issues here, is that uh, how, if he was hit on the forehead, wouldn't the, uh, the momentum push him backward? But of course, a stone isn't way much, even though it's got a lot of velocity compared to a giant like Goliath and his hundred, at least hundred pounds of armor. So it isn't necessarily a physics problem that he couldn't fall forward. It could stun him and not knock him over, and then his own forward momentum would knock him down. He could have staggered and fallen. So it's not required by the fact that he fell uh, to highlight that it can't be his forehead. But falling face down recalls, as we noted last time, the falling down of the statue of Dagon. Um, back when the Ark and Dagon were battling, and perhaps that's proleptic, anticipatory, if you will, of the scene here. Dagon uh, versus Yahweh there, um, and it's now uh, uh, the Philistine versus David. Both face down, fall face down on the ground. So then we have a narrator's uh, summary, and there's something about verse 51 and 52 we have to look at. As I noted, um, uh, 50 and 51, I'm sorry, they form a chiasm, but there's an order here and a couple of contradictions if we read it just straightforwardly here. So first of all, this verse is not in the Septuagint, as you can see over here. Uh, the whole verse is not. So if we were just reading from the he, from the Greek, we'd hear he fell face down on the ground, then David ran and stood over the Philistine, which therefore has no chronological problem. But here it says, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. But in the next verse, it says, he then he killed him, and Goliath's sword is in his hand. So uh, it could be a number of things. It could be that this verse is simply out of place, that it should have gone after this right here, perhaps. But let's look at a, at a couple of scholars say about it. So uh, Fockelman calls it a bold and far-reaching editorial comment. Um, uh, I'm honestly forgetting who LL is at the moment, but he offers the real takeaway from this episode is that David does not feel the need to conform to conventional rules of engagement, um, and perhaps that's the case as well, or perhaps it's simply the Hebrew scripture uh, writer adding a summary here about that, and if we were just read straight from here to here, we wouldn't have any problem. So then David ran, and now 
the way we have it, it completes a chiasm. Note it would complete the chiasm even if there was no verse 50 here. And stood over the Philistine. The irony there, of course, that the Philistine would have been towering over him. And now uh, with the Philistine on the ground, David can stand over him. And grasped, or literally took his sword, Goliath's sword, the druid out of its sheath is unique to the Hebrew here, as you can see on the right side. Uh, why? It's not clear. Uh, why? It's important either to insert that to a pre-existing Greek or for the Greek to take that out of the pre-existing Hebrew, as we've been talking about. It's not clear which came first. Um, but there it is. He drew it out of its sheath and killed him um, and cut off his head with it. So let's look at a few images of how artists have portrayed uh, David's cutting off the head of Goliath here. The oldest of this set we'll look at here is uh, from Titian from 1542. And here I like this one because it shows the theological element that David is praying or at least expressing gratitude to God for the victory there. Um, half a century later from Guido Reni, uh, we see this one with Goliath's head on these blocks like it's a trophy. Uh, and you notice the exaggerated size of the head here. This is not like a human at all. This is like some kind of monster. Uh, similarly, in one from just three decades later, Bernardo Strozzi from 1636. And I like this one because what's with the red feather? Um, there, I'm not an art historian, of course, uh, and I, so I don't. Somebody else can tell about that, perhaps. And it's obviously suggests victory, but the, somehow having the young boy David wearing this fancy hat with the red feather um, is surprising. Uh, and then finally, here's one from the modern world, just to highlight how the metaphorical idea of David and Goliath has played out. This one showing a Palestinian child holding off an Israeli tank, and I don't need to talk about the ironies of that one. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The word for champion here, Gibberam, is different than the word we saw earlier in 17.4 and 23, translated in the new RSV as champion, but literally meant was a man between. And whether that was between the mountains or between the people and the enemy wasn't clear, and scholars uh, dealt with deal with that. We looked at that then. But now it's Gibber, just as young David is described as that. It simply means a powerful person. And so then when they saw their powerful person was done, they fled, matching and reversing the Israelites fleeing uh, back in, in verse 24. Um, so let's complete our passage and then we'll look at a couple of summary things here. So the troops of Israel, and the New RSV consistently over-militarizes the language here, translating sometimes as troops or as soldiers, when in fact it's simply the men. And I really want to highlight that because this is not some formal army with uniforms and uh, all kinds of procedures and institutional traditions. Uh, this is a recent phenomenon. Saul is the first and only king there's been, and so it's only during his lifetime that they have any kind of standing army at all. And it's not even clear it is a standing army. It's not even clear that this isn't just a muster like in the period of the judges. So I just want to highlight these are not professional soldiers, but just the men. But here it's Israel and Judah. And this is the first time we've seen Israel and Judah named together since 11.8. We've seen a couple of times where Judah was named as providing soldiers. And we saw that in back in 17.1, where there's this unusual likelihood that Soko belonged to Judah, highlighting that. Whereas, as we looked at it at the time, it's unclear whether Judah as a tribal unit or as a geographic unit even existed at the time. And we'll look more that as we explore the David story more and the work of Brooke Halpern around that. But here the troops of Israel and Judah are together, even though in the next verse it's only the Israelites. So the troops of Israel, for whatever reason, are here together. Perhaps it's just simply framing the entire chapter, not exactly chiastically, but it's a piece of that. Rose up with a shout, um, echoing the shout in 1720, and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. Let's return to the map for a minute just so we can picture this. These are the five cities of the Philistines, traditionally understood, and so they're, uh, they're retreating back to these towns, having gone from the battle here. And it's suggesting that these troops of the Israelites and Judah chased them all the way back there, which is a fairy tale kind of story here. Just because the Philistines lost Goliath, lost Goliath doesn't mean they still wouldn't likely have better weapons and better defensive uh, material than the Israelites would and could have just stood there and taken them on. And we'll see throughout the rest of the book that Philistines do just fine taking on the Israelites. But I suppose we're supposed to understand they're just so shocked that all they could do is run away and run all the way home. Whether that's meant to be realistic or like putting their tail between their legs and running home and mocking the Philistines, uh, you can decide. And as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, suggesting perhaps they didn't actually make it to the city of Ekron, but of course there's no reason to think they didn't get there. So it's an unusual specification here, the gates of Ekron um, over here. So the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. 
pun. And the word for wounded here, Sha'oli, is only here. And uh, that'll be reversed, we'll see, in 31.8, when the wounded uh, Saul runs away, um, fa falls on the ground away from the Philistines. The uh, place Sha'arim is not on the map, as you can see on the right. It's mentioned in Joshua, along with Soko and Azekah. So it's somewhere in this area. It means two gates. Um, and then, uh, so that ends our Kayas, and when we complete it with these last two verses here, note again, the Israelites came back from chasing, uh, literally returned from chasing the Philistines, um, uh, literally to set on fire, or as the brown driver Greg's lexicon suggests metaphorically, came back from engaging in hot pursuit against the Philistines, the word only here in the Deuteronomistic history, and plundered their camp, as David will do a number of times later. So it shows that the one stone in that David could fling a sling into the, the Philistines' forehead leads the Philistines to turn tail, to leave their wounded on, falling on the way, the Israelites coming back and plundering their camp, a complete victory for the Israelites. And note there's no sense of any wounded Israelites or any firing back from the Philistines at all. They just simply run all the way back. So given that, we have um, verse 54 here, and that's where we'll stop here. <clears throat> Excuse me. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in the tent. Um, and as Falkelman notes, um, I can scarcely find any advantages in the presence of this verse, because there are many problems about it. Um, Jerusalem is not named in the story until 2 Samuel 5, and then it has to be taken by David and his troops from the Jebusites. So uh, this verse is plainly out of context, and perhaps from some other time, and perhaps from some other time where people hadn't read the rest of the story. Um, and it says he put his armor, that's of course Goliath's armor, in his, presumably David's, tent. But the pronouns are ambiguous here, although he obviously wouldn't put, he has a, no armor of his own, and he obviously wouldn't putting, be putting Goliath's armor in Goliath's tent, so we have to assume that here. Um, Sumora notes the tent as a military residence here, which is to say the temporary uh, site of people while they're awaiting battle or awaiting movement to another war site. Um, suggesting that David is immediately honored and now brought into the army. So he's gone from being the, uh, the musician uh, serving Saul in uh, Saul's home, uh, or wherever it was, it wasn't specified, to being um, embraced by the army as one of theirs. But whether he'll be embraced by Saul is another story, and that's what we'll see in our next video. See you uh, for that then. Bye-bye.